the Felora from Firebird Summit. So, you know, obviously I've spent a lot of time recently talking about what we need at work. And an interesting conversation emerges when I ask that question quite a bit. And it seems to come up a lot with people who are probably age-wise around the top end of Generation X and older. Um, my father mentioned it, um, and some colleagues who are at least a decade or so older than me have also mentioned it. And that is the idea really thought about it. You know, most of them were raised at a time and in a set of circumstances where work was really just driven mainly by your most basic financial requirements. And it's an interesting conversation to have, and it, it a lot of times can devolve into the generational boomers versus millennials kind of debate, which I think is mostly bullshit. But when it comes to um, one main area, uh, there is one significant difference. I think, and that is that people who were raised at a time and in a place where having a job was just what you did to meet your family's responsibilities versus, um, you know, having a job that can actually be meaningful and help you grow and, and be an important part of, of your life and your experience and how you enter the world, um, I think has more to do with expectations and with an enculturated learning than it does with what we actually want. Because I don't think I can buy that there's anybody anywhere who wouldn't like to have and wouldn't prefer to have a job that they find meaningful. Now, I think there are plenty of people who, for what whatever reason, never expected to be able to find that. And so they had to learn over time to live without it. Um, and I think if you're going to have a debate about boomers versus millennials, and we can skip where Gen X falls in the middle of that debate. Um, but if you want to have that debate, I think it has more to do with that expectation than what we all want, want. Because when you boil it all down, I think we all want the same thing. The difference is, is that certainly probably the bottom half of Gen X and younger was not necessarily raised to believe that we simply had to do without. Um, and those of us, you know, and I am Generation X through and through. Um, but I worked in tech from a very early time. And so as a result, there are plenty of ways in which um, I'm probably often a little more stereotypically millennial than I am Gen X or older. And it really just comes down to the fact that I got caught up in the tech wave in, from a fairly early point in time and definitely early in my career development. And so the things that went with it, which included a lot of drive for self-actualization as part of work, uh, really were part of what I came of age expecting to be able to find in the right work environment. And so as part of this conversation, one of the things that I like to do is take a step back. People who were not raised um, in an environment that fostered that or that even believed that that were necessarily something that most people had the right to hope for, um, I think really sometimes struggle with the idea of why why it's really important, right? They they have often found themselves in a uh, just suck it up kind of situation and sometimes struggle to understand why other people just don't do the same. Um, and I like to use the stats that you see on the screen here from Gallup as really the difference between what employee engagement can mean to your business versus what it doesn't. And I think there are some important things to keep in mind, right? Um, in the in the 50s and the 60s in the U.S., so much of what fueled the strengthening of the American middle class was very industrial kind of work. Right. It meant that the, the work that people were engaged in on a daily basis often was about interacting with machineries and machinery and their colleagues, not direct customers. And I think this is a really important distinction to start thinking about. Because today, the U.S. has principally a service-based economy. That means that one way or another, either directly or indirectly, most employees have the ability to influence a customer's experience. And the customer and the money they're willing to spend is directly related to the degree of comfort they experience in that interaction and in all of their interactions. You know, for instance, my parents own senior care facilities in California. So every single employee who works in every single one of their homes, as well as 
the other residents and the family members of the other residents have an absolute effect on the overall tone and quality of life that my parents business can provide simply because all of those people have an influence. And so when it comes to questions about does it really matter? Does engagement matter? Or why does it matter? The thing is, is that you can't ever get past your own head. And if you are miserable and having a bad day, odds are you're more inclined to snap at people, to be grumpy, to be impatient, to make mistakes, or simply to just check out and not actually be fully present and checked in to what needs to be done. And in a business, again, like my parents, where you're dealing with elderly, sick, lots of dementia, lots of people who need that amount of presence and that degree of attentiveness and attention to detail. That means that if you are mentally in your own way, there is no way you can assume that will not get in the way of doing your job well. So what I love about the work that Gallup does is that they do is that it's all very scientifically based. They have done thousands and thousands of different permutations of data slicing on the research they've collected around culture, employee engagement, and strengths, as well as all of the pieces and how they fit together, including how best to manage people in these environments. So when it comes to the question of does employee engagement really matter, this is the slide that I love the best because this really talks about the things that are so difficult to quantify, but that anybody who is in a services based business understands these things move the needle and they make a big, big difference in your ability to effectively deliver your product or services and then turn a profit at the end of every single month. So whether it's absenteeism, safety issues, turnover, Shrinkage, which for those not in retail means stealing, um, you know, safety issues, customer um, customer satisfaction, productivity or, or net net on the profitability front. Every single metric is improved when you have employees who are engaged. So then it leads to the next question, which is what does it actually take to have engaged employees? And this is really where I keep coming back to the 12 questions. And these are so important, but yet hard to pinpoint more often than we think. Um, and I've been writing and I'll keep writing a lot about each of these questions and, and each of the pieces over the next few weeks um, and what it means. But I really want to start at the bottom. You know, I've spent a lot of time in my career in rapidly changing environments. Usually I have been brought in to help deal with the chaos of either explosive growth or an acquisition or preparation for an acquisition or a merger or some kind of massive pivot of the business. And I have to say that this first one, I know what is expected of me at work is the one on this list more than any other that bosses take for granted that people know, but the people don't actually know. More than anything else, I have seen this time and time and time and time again. And this is especially true if there is any kind of change in the business. People are creatures of habit, by and large. And the comfort that we take from knowing what we need to do when we go to work in the morning is enormous. It's a very fundamental psychological security blanket for us, as well as our only benchmark to know whether or not we're really going to be successful. So this question for me is almost always the first question I ask of a manager when they are struggling with an employee. Does the employee know what is expected of them? And of course, 90% of the time the manager says, well, of course. And I said, well, have you had this conversation with the employee? And then they have the conversation with the employee. And the next time I speak to the manager, the manager says something along, along the lines of, wow, he really didn't know what was expected of him. And I cannot count how many times I have this experience. And I think that it is super difficult to remember that this piece is something we can't take for granted. Now, the second one on this list is also really important, and I think this is another thing where managers often don't understand the day-to-day -day pain 
that systems and tools and processes can have on their employees' ability to do their job. You know, in, in one of my last corporate roles, I was in a position where I had enormous hoops to jump through from an internal systems perspective. And my boss, because he was high enough up the food chain that he didn't have to deal with those things, really did not understand how much time I spent on some of this stuff and how much time my staff spent on some of these things. And the very nature of the systems and tools that had been implemented to be given to us were actually in the way of doing our jobs effectively. And that is an enormous morale problem. You know, um, Marcus Buckingham in his latest book, um, uh, which is called The Nine Lies of, of Leadership, or sorry, The Nine Lies About Work. Um, Marcus used to work for Gallup, by the way, and now he, he runs ADP's culture uh, program. Uh, anyway, in his latest book, he talks about a very fundamental issue, which is that systems always trump values. You can, it doesn't matter what you espouse as a culture or anything else. If you put a system in place that your employees must engage with in order to do their job, and that system makes their life difficult, complicated, or hard to navigate, you are undermining everything you hope to have in your environment by throwing roadblocks in their way. Because at the end of the day, the system rules because it's not flexible. It does not change. And especially when we're dealing in a world of very highly integrated IT systems, you have no choice but to go through each step and execute the system as it was implemented. Even if people doing the implementation had no idea what your reality looks like on a daily basis. So for me, these two bottom ones are such huge obstacles. And when I see employees or see teams that have employees that are really struggling with engagement, all of these questions are ultimately important, but more often than not, I find the biggest obstacles are in these first two questions and even bigger of an issue is that their managers rarely realize it until they stop and go ask the question because these are not questions that we're taught to ask. People forget that you know other people don't, don't know what's going on in your head. So if you're a leader and you're especially in the middle of a lot of change and chaos and reorganizations or, or mergers and acquisitions or you know, explosive growth or any number of things that will cause a lot of dynamic change to an environment, the truth is you can't ever assume that you can go more than a week without reiterating to your staff on a one-on-one -on -one basis exactly what is expected of them. Most of their jobs change too fast and the responsibilities of the department change too frequently for them to be able to just coast on a definition of what they were expected to do that's six months old. So if you had to ask your employees whether or not they really understand what's expected of them at work, what do you think their answer would be? So that's it for this week. Have a wonderful, wonderful week, and I will talk to you next week.